I was saying, I'll try and not put you guys to sleep, but some of the things that I'm talking, uh, it's a little bit of, a bit boring. There's a lot of databases involved and stuff like that. Uh, but yes, a couple of things to uh, agree upon. There's no big data involved. There's literally no big data involved. There, there are large data sets. There's a lot of maps. Uh, so, and this is probably slightly different from some of the presentations uh, around the conference uh, because there's no enterprise infrastructure. There's not a lot of money. There's that sort of stuff, right? So this is a totally open source project that I'm going to be talking about, completely driven by people like Wikipedia. Um, okay, so let's give it a shot. Uh, how many of you guys heard about OpenStreetMap? That's exciting. Uh, have you guys used OpenStreetMap? Have you guys edited stuff in it? Have you used the map elsewhere? Have you used it for routing, finding directions? It's not very good. That's we're getting there soon. Um, excellent. So, OpenStreetMap. For those of you who don't know about the project, uh, it's a it's a ten year old open source project. Uh, it's the world's largest open source geographic data repository, uh, completely created by people like you. Uh, it's more defined like the Wikipedia for maps. Uh, it's for the entire planet. If you go to openstreetmap.org, you can see the map. Um, I'm going to show some numbers and try and convince you that OpenStreetMap is the thing right now, okay? Uh, there are about 2 million users, 2 million mappers. That's a pretty big number for a project that's just 10 years old. Uh, there are about 2,000 people editing the map every day, uh, adding at least one waypoint or a GPS point every day, which is pretty big. Um, I'd like to call OpenStreetMap as an insanely successful project, because not because I've been involved with it for over six years, but um, the amount of data, the amount of complexity the community has gone through, the kind of infrastructure that the community supports right now, is insane. It's it's fabulous. The, we don't have a lot of enterprise big data infrastructure, but we use a lot of open source solutions to get around these kind of large data set issues. And especially geographic data is complicated. How many of you guys worked with maps, geographic data, GPS devices? Yeah. Right. So it's an insanely successful project. And right now, as of this morning, there are about 4 billion, I think that's 4 billion, 4 billion GPS points in our database. And it's all open. It's all across the world and it's open. Um, like I said before, uh, there's a lot of complex data. Geographic data is in itself a bit complex if you think about it. This is, I just have a bunch of screenshots. So this is the screenshot of Bangalore where I've selected all the nodes and all the roads and points and everything. So kind of gives you a sense of the complex data that goes into making a single piece of map, right? There's a lot of information there. Uh, hmm. Sadly, that picture didn't come out really well. Um, so if you guys can see, it's a, it's a roundabout. This is a place called Swindon in England. And this is a very famous roundabout. It's called the Magic Roundabout because it's a complicated situation. Uh, there are all these blue arrows that you can see. Uh, it gives you like which direction your, the traffic can go and things like that. So we do have lots of traffic information. It's not very complete uh, because it's volunteer driven. And if you guys can help out, that'll be excellent. Uh, there are lots of people trying to use OpenStreetMap for navigation and things like that. And exactly why the data is so complex now. Um, there are about 2.7 billion nodes. 263 million ways and 3 million relations. So I'm going to talk about nodes, ways, and relations in a bit. Uh, but to give you an idea of how big the project is and how large the data set is. Uh, do you guys think this is big data? Not quite sure. Yes? No? Yes? Still sleeping? Fine. How does this sound? So there's the uncompressed data 
the, the production database is as of yesterday just over 400 GB. Is that big data? No. Some people are saying yes. I'm interested. Excellent. So this is a large data set. I don't quite know what big data is, but um, like I said, it's been around for 10 years. Uh, the project started in 2004, uh, and since then, it's everything's been developed in open. Uh, it's been an exciting journey since 2004, and we're celebrating the birthday on August 9th. So we might have some events in Bangalore. So if you guys are around, come over. Uh, it's open. Everything about OpenStreetMap is open. All the infrastructure, all the data, all the mailing list archives, all IRC archives, all the conversations that people have, all the source code, everything is open. And the reason why I want to try and introduce OpenStreetMap as the reasonable infrastructure for spatial data is because of my experience dealing with OpenStreetMap and geographic data for a while. And I've been involved in this very exciting project, which we do in the Democratic Republic of Congo. That's where the map is. Uh, the project's called Moabi. I don't know whether you guys have heard about it. We just had a launch in April. Uh, Moabi is an independent platform which helps you. It's a collaborative mapping platform to track natural resource extraction in the Congo. Um, it's a we're talking about forests and palm oil other resources like that. So this is sort of an aerial view of one of the major forests. And the Congo Basin, the forest is probably the second largest forest after the Amazon, which is still intact. The, the second largest rainforest that, that is intact after the Amazon. And there's been a lot of, the Congo Basin's been kind of the area of, like of conflicts for decades, and it's been increasingly peaceful in the last couple of months and years. Um, this also means that it's more prone to extraction of natural resources because there are lots of stakeholders involved, lots of organizations involved, and it's a fairly complicated situation if you want to get into this. Uh, it's fairly risky, uh, and a lot of these stakeholders have way more control than what they should what they're supposed to have and this kind of creates a lot of issues uh, and the, and the, this large amount of forest also have somewhat unknowable importance to global climate change and there's still research is happening around it so we work with the local communities we collect a lot of data on the ground uh, this is a picture from one of the recent mapping activities that we did uh, in, in the forest with the pygmy communities in it uh, so this is more like local on the ground action, very localized approach of data collection. Uh, most of the, the apps that we use uh, are picture driven. There, there's no text in it because most of the people can't read. Um, so we're targeting different kinds of users. This is another, so they actually draw a lot of pictures on the, on papers and kind of encourage conversations around these several issues that we're dealing with. Um, so there's several kinds of users that we're dealing with to give you a sense of what sort of stuff that we're doing, right? We deal with these local communities who don't have access to GPS devices or phones or computers for that matter. But what they understand is pictures and mostly some printed maps. And then we have people who are involved with OpenStreetMap and other people who are on the internet who like to read about things and, you know, get to know about what's happening around them. Uh, and also some people who would want to go on the map and edit it and help us build the database, help us correct things and, you know, build the data, uh, even make it even better. So we, so we've been, Moabi, it's been around for a while. Uh, this is the second iteration of the project. Uh, the first iteration, I think it was sometime in 2009. Uh, at that point of time, OpenStreetMap wasn't a major thing. It was still around, but the infrastructure was still being experimented and things like that. So the people who were involved with Moabi at that point of time built it in somewhat obsolete technology called Drupal 6. Uh, and that's also at that point of time, people think that Drupal is the solution for everything, right? Are there any people thinking about Drupal as the solution for everything right now? 
Excellent. Oh no, there's some people there. <laughs> Excellent. Um, so, oh no, these pictures are horrible. Um, so we 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 took the entire OpenStreetMap infrastructure to build out the new version of Mojave. Um, so this is this is the OpenStreetMap interface. You have a map. You have a bunch of other layers. So you have your base layer. You have your other natural resources layer and things like that. Um, and then we make these beautiful maps from this data set, this large data set that we collect on the ground and from satellite images, right? Which I will go into in a bit. Um, and then we target the rest of the users who want to just browse the map and also read about things. Uh, we created this whole reports interface where people can use the maps that we make and write stories about it. So we have a lot of researchers working with us dealing with these actual issues on the ground and they write about these things, use our maps, they make more maps and things like that. So the platform kind of does this. It takes data, creates maps. And then with those maps, you tell stories. That's that's kind of the thing. It doesn't do anything else. It just takes some data, creates some maps, stories. But Making maps and collaboratively editing geographic data, it's a tricky thing because geographic data changes very often and making maps is not that straightforward. It used to be very difficult, but now with the kind of tools that we have right now, it's actually quite great. So most people just want to create maps, right? How many of you have maps in your product? Not a lot. Do you guys use Google Maps in the product? Do you guys like custom maps? Maps that are colored to your color scheme and your designers will be able to change things. Right? So, most people just want to do that. They just want to create custom maps in their products. They just want to serve custom styles, custom colors for their maps and not just use the good old Google Maps style or the or the standard OpenStreetMap style. So this is where we start talking about a tile server, and this is slightly the boring bit, uh, because we have to now talk about infrastructure, right? So we have the data, we use something called the tile server, and then we make tiles. Do I have to explain what tiles are? Yes. Okay. Do you guys know when Google Maps came into being? 2004. Have you used Google Maps back then? It was what? MapQuest much later. Google Maps is 2004-2005. Uh, so the early web maps, when maps came onto the web, it was amazing because you could pan, you could move around, you can zoom, it was mind-blowing, right? You could also copy things. But the problem was, when the maps was loading in your browser, it was just one single image. It was just one massive image, and that would often crash your browser. And it was nearly impossible for you to pan the map easily, right? And then times change, and these people came up with this really cool idea called map tiles. So you take the whole map, split it into several square pieces, and it creates somewhat a seamless user experience on the browser. So you essentially load map, map tiles for the areas that you're looking at right now and don't load the other things. Since map tiles are small, you can quickly load them when the user maps to another area. Right? Are you guys with me? Map tiles make sense? Excellent. That's probably the first time I explained it right. Okay. So, so that's where this thing called tile server comes in. So you need to create map tiles and not just one canvas of map. Right? That's how you serve web maps these days. This is, we're talking about raster tiles. There's also this thing called vector tiles these days. Um, people do that also. I'm not gonna get into vector tiles, but I'll show you a little bit of infrastructure stuff as well. Okay, so most people just wanna create custom maps. And this is where you should go. If you wanna take OpenStreetMap data, if you just want a base map in your product, which is styled to your design, whatever, design, schema or style guide or whatever, you need to get the planet. The planet's the OpenStreetMaps data dump. 
and which is also uncompressed 400 GB plus. Um, I have a little bit of boring flowcharts here because that I thought it would be easier to explain this infrastructure stuff, right? So you have the planet down, and there's this thing called the diff. We all know what diffs are, right? Right? Yes. Um, so, like I said, the planet is a massive file. It's 400 GB. So, and the data keeps updating. Like I said before, there are about 2,000 people updating the map every day. So, you want to be able to keep up with that. So, when the map, when the master database changes, it creates diffs, and then you apply that on top of your existing planet. That's how that's how you keep up with your the new updates and this is kind of a replication process if you guys are familiar with and there's a tool called osmosis which does this sort of stuff you can create replication you can create devs and apply it on your database um, the other important aspect here is this thing called the osm to pgsql i have to make it very clear that we're using only postgres sql uh, that's the canonical database that's used across the open map infrastructure so you have your you have your data, you have your diffs, and you run it by this tool called OSM to PGSQL, which will give you a nice and shiny database. And and now it's where you get starting to style your data. Now you need to say that, okay, this line, it's a road, so it has to be black. This area, it's a lake, so it has to be blue. So now you attach your styles onto the data, and you render them. That's That's just about it. And the thing that we used to render, it's a very popular open source project written in C++ called Mapnik. It's a high performing map rendering engine. Um, it's open source, so you guys can go and figure it out. Uh, it's fairly straightforward to set it up. Um, it supports multiple languages, Unicode, and all that stuff. Um, but the only catch is that styles are defined as XML. Do you guys like XML? going to make you love XML towards the end of the stock. So, oh, I'm sorry. How about now? Okay. Hmm, sorry. I'll try and be a little louder. Okay, so we have, we have Mapnik and we have the data. So now we need to style and we use something called the Mapnik XML. How many of you guys heard about Tile Mill? Yes. Excellent. So Tile Mill is this new Map Studio written in Node.js, built by these nice people at Mapbox. Uh, so it kind, so kind of helps you not to write Mapnik XML anymore. You can, they kind of introduced this idea called Kato CSS, which is like CSS, but for maps. So you use your CSS selectors, just how you, and you select your map objects based on these selectors, and then you apply styles on it. And then you can convert that into Mapnik XML and throw it onto Mapnik and it'll render these styles. Um, two more things into this whole stack. You have, you have Apache, so your browser is requesting tiles. Your browser is requesting maps. And Apache is in the middle of this. It grabs the request. And this is Apache mod called mod tile. It's now the, I think it was written in C or C++, but it, what basically, what mod tile does is that it grabs the request, finds which tiles have been requested, and tells this guy called render d it's the render demand it tells render d to make those styles and serve it back so render d tells mapnik to create those styles and then caches it and give it back to mod tile and then you have your map right is that this is okay does it make sense right so this is your tile server it's a fairly straightforward process to set it up uh, takes about under an hour if you know what you're doing and also read the documentation properly. Um, so now you have your custom map and you can add endless number of styles onto this. The same data can take endless, endless styles and you can create multiple uh, map layers which look different. And that's exactly what we are also doing uh, at Moabi. Um, Couple of things that we did uh, on our project, which made a lot of, which made our lives much easier. So, as you can already see, that updating these styles and getting them 
are adding new styles are fairly complicated because you have to tell Mapnik about these things. So you have to update our config files and things like that. So we introduced this Git workflow to manage cartography and styles. So essentially, your designer will push these Carto files, the tile mill files, into your Git repository. And there's a nice little fabric script which does all the magic for you. So it'll take all the changes, push it on the server, deploy it, and redeploy it, and all that stuff. Um, all this is open source, so you guys can look it up. So that's the rendering tool chain. This is called the rendering tool chain if you are in the maps world. Uh, and that's that's how you build a tile server. And so everything what I've been talking about so far is on this website called switch to osm.org. Uh, it's a very informative website where they have several guides about using OpenStreetMap data, setting up a tile server, what sort of stuff do you need in terms of setting up tile server, how do you tune your database, um, what are the considerations, what are the optimizations that you need to do, things like that. Okay, so now we have the tile server. So that's mostly what 90% of people would want. They just want to serve custom tiles, right? Um, but we also want to collect data. We also want to collect geographic data, structure them, also make it collaborative and easy to edit, and things like that. So it's a little complicated. Like you, like you've seen with the tile server, there are several moving parts, and with the whole system coming into being, there are lots of moving parts um, and lots of things that you have to consider and things like that. It's not that bad. Uh, everything's quite well documented. Um, there are only three steps. OpenStreetMap does have only three steps. It's edit your map, add data, style it, and render it. So we've actually seen styling and rendering already. I haven't gone into a lot of depth with styling because it's all available online and you guys can look it up. It's fairly straightforward. So you can style and render, then that's that's kind of it. So now the edit bits, so how do you add data, how do you collect this data, and how do you tag and structureize, you know, that sort of stuff. Okay, so mostly you have three kinds of geodata coming into your system. You will have satellite images, like Viral was speaking a lot about satellite images, and QGIS and things like that. We use Maps World to make things. Um, you have GPX files, things that's coming from your GPS devices. There'll be NMEA and other similar formats which are coming straight from your GPS device. And also you have your traditional GIS uh, things like shape files, things like that that you get, you download from internet or you just collect from some university or something. Um, see, OpenStreetMap does this whole data editing through things called editors, of course. And there are two editors, which if you guys have played with OpenStreetMap, you must have seen. There's one called ID and the other one called Jawson. So the ID is, ID is built in JavaScript, it's pure JavaScript built on top of D3, if you guys know about D3. Um, it's a really cool uh, project uh, if you want to know. They don't, use, they, ha they don't use any JavaScript framework. It's just vanilla JavaScript and D3. It's, it's a great open source project. If you're getting into single page web app development, um, you should take a look. I've been working with ID and it's, a, it's, it's, it's mind blowing. It's a really interesting uh, set of source code. Um, ID lets you take a satellite image and you can draw on top of it and you can draw vectors from it. So this is how you would add data into the system using ID. Uh, since it's open source, you can customize it the way you want. You can, we've customized ID in several ways, very specific to the data that we have, uh, and it's really straightforward. Uh, Jawsum, it's the Java OpenStreetMap editor. It's a slightly high level offline um, heavy duty application. Uh, people use it for like bulk imports or you know large data sets and things like that. Um, and Jawson is also customizable. You can take it and make it the way your data want an editor and things like that. Um, so that's the editor. And now the really cool thing about OpenStreetMap is that it has a nice API which 
takes all the data that's coming through your editor and puts it in your database. Uh, and this API is also used to create users. You can do revisions with your geographic data, which I'll talk about in a bit, which is also very important. Um, and you can do all that sort of stuff. So you have you have this API which does all this magic. And then you take this data into your tile server, which is the next big part, right? So that's kind of the whole infrastructure. You take your data, you edit it, you import bulk data sets if you want, uh, use the OpenStream API. We'll talk about how this data has been modeled and all in, in, in a minute. Um, so the way OpenStreetMap models the data is using three data primitives. It's called one's node, the other one's way, and the other one's relations. So earlier I showed a slide with the numbers of these things on the database, right? Uh, a node is actually a point. It has a latitude and longitude attached to it. It's just a point. And a way is an ordered list of nodes. Ordered list of two or more nodes. So you can see there are more nodes. So there are closed ways which you would which this closed way where the starting node and the ending node will be the same, and you can have a area. Uh, so, for instance, if you draw a building, it'll be an area, right? It'll be a closed way. Um, and then you have a relationship. Geography is all about relationships, gra capturing things on the ground and the relationships between them. So you have a data primitive for relationships. Um, and the three geometric objects that you use generally representing geographic data in vector format uh, digitally, right? Points and lines and polygons. So point is your point of interest, line is a road, for instance, and polygon is like a building or an or administrative boundary or things like that. This is actually the super secret source of OpenStreetMap. Uh, they're called tags. And this is how OpenStreetMap adds metadata into into these geometry objects. And I'll tell you how you can scale these tags. Um, yeah, that picture is not very clear. So a tag is actually essentially a key value pair, right? And for instance, highway equal to primary is a is a key value pair. Name, at a public You guys heard about this highway? And so relation, the relationship is it belongs to a national highway relationship, right? Does that make sense? This bunch of key value pairs. So you essentially draw a line and say that okay, this is this is highway equal to primary. It has a name and it belongs to a relationship, right? And this is actually very scalable because you can have n number of tags. You can have any sort of metadata to your to your geographic data. And this is very well documented in the OpenStreetMap wiki. Uh, I'm gonna leave that link there. And I'll take you guys to this whole idea of presets. So, now we've seen key value pairs, but what if we want to have multiple key value pairs that will represent a single entity on the, on the ground? So here at the example, I think it's a mining concession. So we, we use bunch of tags, to represent a mining concession. So it's essentially a geographic feature and you can have multiple metadata attached to it, but you use a single preset, which is a collection of tag and a uh, collection of tags to represent that object in the database. Uh, if you're familiar with ID, ID uses uh, presets. Uh, if When you start drawing things, it'll list all the presets on the left side. Um, there's a slightly complicated way of adding new presets and uh, adding new tags into the OpenStreetMap production database because you have to join a mailing list, you have to propose a tag, it has to be voted upon, it has to be decided whether it's actually meaningful to add those things. But when you're using the OpenStreetMap infrastructure for, uh, for your own uh, data purposes, you just want to add more presets. And we've been working on a preset editor that lets you create these presets. All right, I'm going to have to leave it here because if you deal with geographic data and not use PostgreSQL, it's kind of sucky. It's, it doesn't work otherwise. Um, do you guys recognize this logo? There are lots of elephants. 
So this is the logo for PostGIS. It's an extension to Postgres SQL to deal with spatial data. So OpenStreetMap uses Postgres with uh, PostGIS. Um, and this is how you scale key value pairs and presets. You can use this cool thing called head store in PostgreSQL and shove all your tags into head store and you don't have to deal with your schema. So you can add your geographic data but keep storing your tags. And you don't have to decide your tags early on before you model your data. So if you think that at some point you want to add another tag, you just have to shove it into head store. It will still work. And all the softwares in the pipeline dealing with OpenStream app data supports it stored, you just have to enable it. Um, I'll quickly talk about the API. It's a RESTful XML API. Um, it's XML because all the data formats that OpenStreetMap deals with is XML. Uh, this is how the XML looks like. Yeah, this doesn't look too well. Uh, so you represent all the nodes and ways and relationships uh, with XML. So essentially you can see who added this, the user ID, the visibility, the chain set, which I'll talk about in a minute, and then all the key value pairs and things like that. Um, and this is another cool thing with what you get free f with this infrastructure. Uh, most often when you collaborate on geographic data, you want to be able to revision that. You want to be able to version that and you might want to go back because there are lots of people editing it. Uh, OpenStreetMap uses this idea called chain set. So every time you make a change, a new chain set is created. So all the changes that you've made is part of a chain set and gets saved into your database. So you can go back to a chain set at any point of time. Um, people have built really cool things uh, around the OpenStreetMap data. Uh, there's this thing called Overpass. Uh, it's open source. It lets you, it kind of takes your database and creates a nice API around it so that your app, apps can talk to it. Uh, apps can talk to your direct, your production database. And it lets you export stuff in GeoJSON and other custom JSON formats, and things like that. So Overpass is a really interesting tool. Um, that's kind of what I wanted to share to give you a sense of what this whole geographic infrastructure looks like. Um, so yeah, I'm open for questions. Street man. Uh, did you mean the data or the infrastructure? Uh, so the question was, he wanted to know whether there are any government organizations or authorities using OpenStreetMap data or the infrastructure. Infrastructure, yes. Data, yes. Um, so the National Park Service in the US uses the OpenStreetMap infrastructure. India, so, um, think about it, no. Not that I know of. A lot of them, yes, because it's free. Uh, can you repeat the question? Because uh, His question actually. was, again, the same question, because uh, are people using OpenStreetMap? Are, how, who are the people who are using OpenStreetMap and also the infrastructure? NGOs, you wanted to know if NGOs. Yeah, NGOs them. specifically. Yes, a lot of them. I work for an NGO. Uh, I work for multiple NGOs, all of which we use OpenStreetMap. Uh, Apple uses a little bit of OpenStreetMap if you want to talk about the commercial service providers. Uh, if you've heard about Telenav, it's a major navigation company based in the US. Uh, they use OpenStreetMap for navigation. Foursquare uses OpenStreetMap. Uh, um, Foursquare switched last year, I think. So we're going to give the others, yeah, a little chance. We'll come back to you if there's time, yeah? Thank you. So Anyone else with questions? Yeah, so. Yeah. Uh, uh, we'll go to him and then come to you. Yeah, yes. Uh, actually, last year we were exploring OSM for. Uh, reverse geocoding and geocoding mm. users. And we didn't find it much useful there, but I guess it's a work in progress and the data would be... Right, so, yeah. yeah, geocoding is a tough problem. Uh, it's a, and especially reverse geocoding, it gets even harder. Uh, it depends on the quality of data, which all of us are working on very closely, trying to improve things. Um, the situation in India is a little complicated because we don't have a specific addressing scheme. Even though we have, it keeps changing from city to city and in suburbs to suburbs. Um, there are a couple of recent changes you should 
be able to find a couple of new tools which does really cool reverse geo coding even for India. And I'll be interested to know your feedback as well. So just let me know. I can help you with that. Sure. Just one follow up question. Uh, how about the coverage in China? Because a lot of big hmm. providers they are useless in China because they have their own map providers. Interesting. I haven't checked China, but I assume there's a fairly decent community in China. So, uh, are there any comparisons? Uh, I'm trying to find you. Uh, so, are there any comparisons of your venue data with the uh, Foursquare venue data or factual? Hmm. Good question. So his question is more on the data side uh, of OpenStreetMap. So the way Foursquare uses OpenStreetMap is as a map, is a base layer. So they have their data on top of it and they haven't actually mixed it. But uh, did someone compare how good is OpenStreetMap attribute information with respect? So again, it depends on the neighborhood that you are. If you are in a place where there are a lot of contributors, you get a really cool map. Uh, and you but, get three you lots of. You're not aware of any studies. For, um, no, for, I don't like think there's been any specific study around like point of interest. But there are a lot of people using OpenStreetMap for point of interest. Uh, even Factual does take a lot of stuff from OpenStreetMap and also gives it back. Any other questions? Um, we'll start with the gentleman in pink. Use the mic, please. Thank you. In India, we have Survey of India Maps. Mm -hmm. There's a big project called uh, NOF and National Optic Fiber Network. Yes. Uh, for that, a lot of mapping maps are required. So, other than Google Maps, Survey of India maps uh, are to be used, but uh, I don't think they have comprehensive information. Have you been approached? Uh, so, we've, yeah, Nisha is here and she will know a little bit more about this. We've been trying to get in touch with the Survey of India to talk about the open geographic data situation in India, which is also quite shitty because they don't want to open it. Um, there's not there's, there's, a, there's not a single source of uh, ground truth in India. It's, it's all it's all it's all over the place. There are a lot of people doing stuff, but I always use OpenStreetMap for whatever projects that I'm involved in, and I found it very I mean, it's fairly comprehensive, uh, and if I find something wrong, I can always fix it. No, it's better to collaborate with Survey of India to get. Uh... Right. I mean, unfortunately, the situation is that they're not very, you know, responsive as one would imagine. So we've been trying to approach them. We've been trying to set up a meeting with them to have a chat about this and how to open up more of this data. Thank you. Yeah. Hi. Um, with a platform that's this editable mm -hmm. right? have you ever run into problems with uh, where people you know a do, lot. do dubious edits like uh, yeah. one of uh, the funny thing that happened with wikipedia a while ago was the cto ex cto of sap had a mr bean photo <laughs> attached so anything right. like so that? that's a that's a generic problem with any crowdsourcing platforms uh, people do tend to vandalize a lot uh, but OpenStreetMap is a, like Wikipedia, it's a major, it's a vast community and there are always people watching out for things. And there are also several tools built on top of OpenStreetMap for validation. And, you know, uh, if you make lots of edits in a minute or if you, if your change set is, it's really huge. There are things that trigger alerts into the IRC channel and then people go check, people go check that. And so it's a, it's a fairly nice workflow where you can see who is editing and what's being changed. So people keep an eye on those things. But if you're using OpenStreetMap for your own data infrastructure, that problem doesn't arise. We have two time for two more questions. Uh, gentleman in black. So you mentioned like uh, if uh, somebody wanted to do uh, the color schemes on the tiles, mm -hmm. it's better to set up a tile server, right? Mm -hmm. so there's a project uh, that's either called Leaf dot js or leaflet dot js which lets you do that without having your own tile server on OpenStreetMap data. That's right. So it's called leaflet dot js and it's a JavaScript mapping library. Right. What it does is that it picks your tile server URL and displays that map on the browser, but it won't let you change the colors. Uh, it'll let, so there are some plugins which will let you change the map color into gray and black, but it doesn't do more than that. Oh, that's about. It. That's yeah. Uh, time for uh, one last question. All the way at the back. So, so this is all pretty much the front end view of the data, right? So if if let's say this is a logistics company, mm 
mm -hmm. which wants to use open street map data so how can that be looked at um right so there have been recently a lot of uh work around routing and fleet management and things like that so there are a couple of open source library one is called osrm open source open street routing management not getting that right but it's called osrm it takes open street map data and you can build routes out of it and things like that so it's something that completely work in progress because the data is continuously changing and it's also uh the availability of data is not the same everywhere in the world. It depends on where the contributors are and how we, how excited people are in that neighborhood. So, yeah, does that answer your question? Mr. Anwar, ladies and gentlemen, please put your hands Thank together you. for him.